Friends, I was, I was in prayer a few months back, praying about our ministry and what we put out and resources. And, and I, I got this stirring to start a new series, Dr. Brown Talks with Scholars, where I talk with biblical scholars, theologians, scientists, different intellectuals, academics, about subjects that, well, maybe on a radio show, we can only go so far because we have our format and breaks and things like that. And I'm always thinking of our larger listening and viewing audience. So we only go so far into so much depth, we don't want to lose people. But here we can go even further, because if you're tuning in, you're tuning in for this very reason, and we can get more academic or dig a little deeper. So I made a list of people I wanted to have on the show. And of course, the first, for me, it was, of course, the first was, was my dear friend, uh, Craig Keener, one of the world's foremost New Testament scholars, professor of New Testament at Asbury Theological Seminary, and a man who loves Jesus, loves the Spirit of God, loves the law. So Craig, I, I know you're super busy. Thanks for taking time to join me and to inaugurate this brand new series. It's always my privilege to be with you, Michael. Uh, I just love being with you, whether we're being recorded or not. Yeah, and we, we, we do. Whatever time we can grab together at a conference or any other setting, we, we do it. So I, I want to ask a few brief introductory questions, and then I want to really dig into some subjects, some areas of specialization with you. So before you were saved as, as a kid, young teenager, you thought that the atheists were the smart ones and the enlightened ones, and, and then God opened your heart to the gospel, and, and you were born again, but then you thought, as a teenager, boy, I'm, I'm, I'm behind here because these church people have background and I don't have background. So, so what happened? What, what did you do to, to kind of catch up? I was desperate. So I started reading 40 chapters of the Bible a day. Now, sometimes people think I did that like all the time and have done that ever since. That's not true, but, but I, but I did it just week after week for, for a long time. And yeah, uh, if you do that, you can get through the Bible once in a month or you can get through the New Testament every week. And once, once I started doing that, the, the context began to fit together. So mm. it wasn't like, here's a verse here and here's a verse there with a lot of blank space in between, but I could see how it fit together. You know, I'll say First Thessalonians is a, is a whole letter, or Romans is a whole letter, or Mark is a whole gospel, and so forth. Yeah, and, and how old were you when you started doing that? Probably, I'm guessing maybe 16. Okay, got it. So, so about 16 years old. At, at what point did you feel called to academics? <laughs> um. Actually, that was a little bit of a struggle because I thought, you know, I thought I was so smart, you know, reading Plato and studying all these philosophies and and astrophysics and things like that. And so I thought I was really smart before my conversion. And after my conversion, I said, boy, my mind led me astray. I don't trust human intellect anymore. And and so I was um, I won a National Merit Scholarship to go to you know certain places, but I felt like God wanted me to go to a Bible college and go there for two years. So in terms of academics, that's, that's where it was gonna start. And the National Merit uh, Scholarship wouldn't cover it. And so everybody was mad at me. I mean, everybody, my pastor tried to talk me out of it. Everybody tried to talk me out of it, but I really felt that's what God wanted me to do. And it gave me a good grounding there. I mean, I started Greek and Hebrew my freshman year and got more in terms of the survey of the biblical text, but began to realize I needed background material. And some of my professors were giving us some of that, but I realized they didn't have, most of them didn't have enough of it because it hadn't been given to them. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna go read a reference book and find, find all this material and learn it. And then after my two years, I'm gonna go out and preach. But by the end of the two years, um, I was getting more into the background, but also one of my professors there, Ben Aker, was just, um, he was just a, a good role model, especially of yearning to understand God's word. So 
I would be I would be in prayer and, and God would show me some things in scripture through prayer. And then I would go into class and Ben Aker would say the same thing. And I'm like, wow, he got this through exegesis. So, <laughs> uh, and, and I realized, you know, my call to call the church back to the word, I was thinking, you know, I'd go just visit one church after another and preach there. But I realized like through the example of Ben, if I'm a teacher, I can teach pastors who are gonna go out and, and pastor these congregations long-term. So that gave me more of a vision for, for that. And, and I felt led, you know, at that point when I prayed and I actually wanted to go to school, uh, to go ahead and finish the school there. I then went to study some ancient Near East background at the local university, but began to feel like God wanted me to go to the seminary. So I went to the seminary and then, um, you know, eventually went to Duke to do my PhD and start making that background material available. So, yeah. So I, I want to get into a Duke experience in, in a little while, an interaction with a, with a professor. But listen, you, you understand the gift of God is a gift. We don't boast about it. And, and God's gifted you. He, he's gifted you with, with a brilliance and an ability to produce things. And it's, it's really miraculous. You know, I, I write, I research, I understand the, the effort that goes into things. So he's, God's given you a very supernatural gift. And it's one, of course, you've, you've had to sacrifice and be disciplined and work hard. And, and that's where you get your commendation from the Lord. But it, it's really an incredible gift God's given you. So just in terms of books of the New Testament that you've written commentaries on so far. I know some are full-length academic, some are shorter, but what, what New Testament books have you written commentaries on so far? <clears throat> Two of them on Matthew, big one, little one. Um, I'm, I'm working on Mark right now. That'll take a few years. <clears throat> um, two volumes on the Gospel of John. Well, actually, and then a, another smaller commentary on it. Four volume commentary on Acts, plus a one volume with Cambridge, a short one on Romans, a short one on First and Second Corinthians, a short one and a long one on Galatians, um, First Peter and Revelation. So. And in fact, First Peter, you just sent me the 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 latest, uh, just a, a, another amazing work that. You mentioned a four-volume commentary on Acts that really doesn't paint the picture because of the nature of, of the volumes. Um, how, how many were, aside from the indexes, the back of each of these massive volumes has a CD in it where you get all the indexes because it's just too much to put in there. But the four volumes, do you know the, the word content of the Acts commentary? Before I added a bunch of material, it was about two and a half million words, so maybe three million words. Oh, okay. So, so you gotta, and, and this is a lot of it is dense academic material. In other words, just the researching of an end note sometimes can take you days or weeks to get all just for, for, for a note or footnote. And it, it's chock, it's chock full of this. So I know my, my Israel's divine healer book, which I took some of my dissertation and then turned into a scholarly monograph. That was 80,000 words of main text, 85,000 words of end notes. That was 165,000. That was a academic monograph, maybe about 450 pages. Uh, my latest popular volume, I just sent it to the publisher. There's about 65,000 words. That'll probably come out about, I don't know, 220, 250 pages, something like that. But you're talking about 3 million words of academic commentary, which is far more than some scholars will do in a lifetime. Uh, how... How does this gift operate in you? How, when, when did you become aware that you were operating at, on another plane of what was normal for most human beings? <laughs> yeah. um, actually, when I was indexing the Acts commentary, I was marveling and saying, this is not me. This is not something I could have possibly done. Uh, I mean, it was like 60 hour weeks for 10 years or so. I mean, it was it was intense work and I really needed my brain to recover afterwards. Please, my students during this 10 years, forgive me if you're listening for my uh, craziness. But anyway, um, 
but yeah, when I was indexing, I mean, the indexing took like 60 hour weeks for 14 months or so. And uh, 45,000 extra biblical ancient references, something like 10,000 secondary sources. I don't know how often they were cited. Uh, I mean, multiple times, but, um, but yeah, I mean, looking back when it was finished, I could say, well, God, this is, this is you. Yeah, I, and it's, it's an interesting thing, Craig. When I see your books, I get blessed for two reasons. I get blessed because of the content and I got blessed because I know that God helped you do the work. I don't mean that every interpretation is infallible, but like when I look at the Acts commentary, I praise God, you know, because I know that's the evidence of God just gifting someone's brain and helping. And yes, the hard work, 60 hour weeks for, for 10 years, the persevering to do it. Uh, and, you know, behind you, all these file cabinets, obviously all the things you meticulously indexed for many, many years and compiling information. Didn't you used to have like cards up everywhere and, and you even got a little criticism for that? Tell us that story. <laughs> um, they're actually at my faculty office, rather. This is my home. home oh, office. okay. Got it. Got it. Um, but the, yeah, I had about 100,000 of them before I finally realized, boy, I could save one step just typing directly <laughs> into the computer <laughs> instead of taking them down uh, handwritten first. But yeah, I started doing that for my. A Greek two paper, I think, is a sophomore. And then... Now, what, what was on a card? What did you actually do? Oh, uh, the upper right-hand corner, I put the, the scripture reference, uh, okay. or the, sometimes the topic uh, un, under which it would be filed. And then I'd have like, usually I'd have a subject heading. And then, uh, and then I'd you know, give a, the reference of where I was getting the material. And then I would give the material that I thought was relevant for, for that passage of scripture or that topic. The, the danger, of course, is that there are, there's lots of background material that's relevant for lots of passages. So if you forget where you filed it, <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> but you used to like put those cards up to memorize them and, and, and things, or how, how, did, you, how no. did you go through it? No, 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 I, I, didn't, I didn't memorize the cards. Uh, I okay. had them actually, so I wouldn't have to memorize all the stuff. All right, but so, you, but you did all the indexing, and then you know where, hopefully, know where to find it. Yes, yeah, and, and of course, with a computer, you can copy it into multiple places. Got you, it. You still have to make sure to think ahead about what places you might need it. But a lot of times, I'll be doing something else. Uh, I'll be working on something in Mark, and I'll think, oh, you know, I know, I know the answer to this question, but it's filed under this passage, and so. Um, I want to pass on my stuff to my students when I, when I die, but uh, I've got to help cross index it better for their <laughs> sake. <laughs> yeah, unless they can crawl into your mind, if you can, if you could bequeath your brain as well. So, so um, you mentioned primary sources, secondary sources. So just in case you're watching, you've gotten this far in the interview, but you don't know the difference between those. So we're talking about the Bible, that's a primary source. A secondary source would be someone writing something about the Bible. If we're talking about rabbinic literature, a primary source would be Mishnah or Talmud. Secondary source would be someone writing something about that. You know the secondary literature wonderfully well. I mean, every one of your books is massively indexed with what scholars are saying on this. I mean, there's always more than any one human being can know. I always miss some. <laughs> right, right. But there's, there's a, ton, a ton out there that you're familiar with. But what's often been unique in your work is the amount of primary sources that you'll cite. And I was just showing two of my colleagues that were in before the show, the show today, and I was telling them about our interview that we're going to do. So I was showing them the first Peter commentary. So in the back, you've got bibliography of, of, of all of the, the authors that you cite, etc. And then you've got index of scripture, and you've got Dead Sea Scrolls, rabbinical literature, and then you're getting into classical literature and citing different ones. And honestly, if, if I read 5, 10, 20, 30, I don't even know what these are because I never studied classics in depth. I don't even know what they are. And yet you're citing these. When was it that you felt the need to start learning so many primary sources? Because so many skip over that. They may know the Bible and then a little bit around it, but otherwise it's just what other scholars say. 
whereas you began to immerse yourself in the relevant literature of the ancient world. So was that just because you wanted to know background more? Yeah, I mean, when I was when I was doing the forty chapters a day, uh, I think it, I think it really hit me in Romans. Uh, I think it was probably a Monday, and I was going to do Romans and First Corinthians that day, uh, and I, you know, I'm there in, in Romans what like one six one one seven probably. Um, Paul is writing this to the to the saints in Rome. And I'm like, well, he's writing this to the saints in Rome. This is actually a letter to the saints in Rome. <clears throat> and there are things that Paul takes for granted that his audience knows, not least the Greek language. Uh, but, you know, we have translations for that. But he knows what's going on with the saints in Rome. So he knows how to address those issues. And there are things, and this becomes even, even more of an issue in 1 Corinthians, where uh, he takes for granted that they know what he's talking about when we often don't know, like with the head coverings, the holy kiss is actually in both of those letters, the um, uh, baptism for the dead, First Corinthians 15, 29, and so on. And so I'm like, I don't know what was going on then, but I should. I mean, there's there's ways I can find out some of that because, I mean, we still have a lot of information left from the first century. And I began to get a craving for Bible background, the same as my craving for the Bible. Um, I mean, the, the life isn't in the background, the life is in the Bible, but but as I, I just love the background. And so uh, I, got, I got one book on ancient Judaism, I think by George Foot Moore, and then I got another one by Samuel Sandmel. And uh, I, once I read the second one, I was in trouble because they overlapped a lot but like 20, 30%, they disagreed. And I'm like, uh oh, what, what do I do now? <laughs> and I realized I'm going to have to go back and read the primary sources for myself. And <clears throat> of course, both of those were dealing especially with rabbinic background. And I started in the rabbinic background, but then, um, of course, reading the what we call the pseudepigrapha, Dead Sea Scrolls, and so on. And eventually, I also realized. I mean, it's not as directly relevant, especially for the Gospels or Revelation, but a lot of the Greek and Roman material, before I was a Christian, I was reading Tacitus, I think when I was like 12, in English translation though. Um, so, I, you know, I, I intuitively already understood some things about first century Roman world. And then there were some things like my first time through the book of Acts, I get to Acts 14, and it's talking about um, uh, Paul, Paul is near, near Phrygia, uh, Paul, Paul, Paul and Barnabas, and these people, they think they're Zeus and Hermes, and they want to they offer to them. And I'm like, oh, this is like the story of Baucus and, and uh, Philemon in Ovid's Metamorphosis. And, and then I'm reading the Old Testament, uh, and Genesis 6, I'm reading the flood story, and I'm thinking, this is like the Greek story of Deucalion and Pyra. Did they steal this from the Greeks? And of course I learned eventually, no, this is older than the Greek story. Uh, the, the ancient Near Eastern version is way older than the Greek version. But you know, there were other, other traditions that, that remembered, uh, that, that passed on communal memory of some of these things. And so as I'm, there, there were these things that intuitively came to me because I had, like when I was 12, I, I did Homer, 13, I was reading Virgil and Plato and things like that. So I began realizing, oh, some of these other things, if used rightly, can be helpful too. Um, Plato, I got a little messed up on because I was, you know, when I read Romans 8 for the first time, I was reading it in terms of the body and the soul instead of the more Jewish worldview of we are flesh, but God's spirit can make us alive and, and so on. But um, that's also a reason why you don't want to get just one piece of the background. There are some people, oh, they pontificate like they know what they're talking about. Like, oh, the New Testament's background is mystery religions because you've got a holy kiss and you've got uh, this and that. And almost all the things they cite 
were just standard throughout the culture. Everybody did it. And so mm -hmm. they think it's just mystery religions because that's the only thing they've studied. You know, so if you're going to do it, you need to get a, a wide breadth of, of the background. And, and of course, the, the first book that really put you on the map in the academic world and the wider Christian world was your, your IVP Bible background commentary to the New Testament. You have a second edition of it out. And uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I've used it personally. Uh, and even, even on the radio, something will come up. It's like, oh, I'm not sure on that. And I don't have time to get into a deep commentary. But here it is in one volume, in one place. I can just check quickly. Of course, I always give you credit. Uh, and don't make it like I just realized something or discovered it. But um, so, so my brilliance was to know that I could go to your book and I'd find something relevant there and helpful. But, but in, in point of fact, you know, that, that was a breakthrough book and remains super important. And then a, a cultural backgrounds Bible, several scholars did the Old Testament. You, you did the, the New Testament. And it's just so invaluable to have the background. You know, as you were talking, I was thinking about my daily radio show, right? So the, I do academic work, but then the popular ministry and preaching and all that. But picture someone listening to, to the show 200 years from now in, say, India with no knowledge that Donald Trump ever existed, that COVID ever existed, that we had racial tension or race riots, or you just go through the major events of 2020 and you're listening to my radio broadcast or reading the articles, and maybe I'm not making explicit reference to all that, but that's implicitly in the background. So when, when you put this all together, uh, it even seemed God supplied. There was, did you even see God's hand on you then in writing the IVP Bible background commentary? Yeah, I mean, there were different books that came different ways. So my, actually my first two books was one, one on divorce and remarriage in the New Testament, and then another on gender roles in the New Testament, uh, well, in Paul's writings. Uh, and both of those I felt led to write. The background commentary was more like all these years of work and <laughs> all I wanted to do was go out and preach, you know, but all these years of work just to get the background, I had this craving to get it right. And then I realized, well, actually I realized all along, it's not fair for everybody to have to spend like 10, 12 years doing the, enough background material to get familiar enough with it, to, to know what, what to do with it. Um, so I wanted to put it at people's fingertips. Because I mean, even like with a Bible dictionary or Bible encyclopedia, those are, those are very valuable, but Sometimes if you don't know the background, you don't know which background you need <laughs> to look up. Yep, yep, exactly. And so I wanted to put it at people's fingertips. And I just was like, well, Lord, if, if nobody else has published a book like this by the time I finish my PhD, and I was feeling like InterVarsity Press would be a good place to, to publish it. I was part of the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at, at Duke. And uh, one day, Rodney Clapp, who was then working for university, called me and said, we, we saw an article that you wrote for what was then Evangelicals for Social Action. It was an article on James in the background of James. He said, would you be interested in writing anything for us? So I proposed the background commentary. I thought, oh, this is great. But then when I, when I was getting ready to graduate, I couldn't find a teaching position. Um, so. I mean, today it's hard too for people coming out with PhDs. There's not enough teaching positions. There actually are enough teaching positions in the world if you're willing to move, but <laughs> um, but not always in the same country that you were born in. So uh, I I was you know I was willing to to do what I needed to do, but I I didn't I didn't have an opening, and then um, you know as the summer was going on. Finally, I think it was like in July or maybe early August, it was pretty obvious I wasn't gonna have a teaching position by, by the fall. And my mom kept asking me, uh, do you have a job yet? You know, good thing from, well, now I'm a parent, I understand. <laughs> good thing for a, a mom or a dad to ask. Um, and I was so embarrassed to tell her that I didn't have a job yet. You know, I'd always told her God provides. My mom was not a Christian. 
at the time. And so I, uh, well, you, you know, I was converted from a non, non-Christian, unchurched background. So, um, but very loving parents. Anyway, my, Finally, you know, one Sunday night, uh, like late July, early August, I said, okay, how much am I going to need to live on this year? And it was like, there's no way I can come up with this. I'm going to be on the street this year. Uh, I don't need a big place to stay, but but what's going to happen to my research files? You know, today you can put them on the thumb drive, but not back then. And uh, less than... 24 hours later, uh, well, I wrote to my mom, I said, no, I'm sorry, I don't have fun. Barring a miracle, and I said it like three times, barring a miracle, I don't know what I'm gonna be doing. I can work fast food, but um, but I can't, uh, a fast food job wouldn't have paid for me to keep all my research files. <laughs> so uh, that afternoon, so Monday afternoon, I got a, a phone call again from Rodney Clapp. And he said, we, we want you to write this and we, we'd we like to offer you an advance on it. It was to the dollar what I decided the night before I needed to live on that year. Incredible, incredible. Now later in the year, I did wish that I'd prayed for more, but anyway. <laughs> and you had, you had people on their knees praying for the project. You, you had- Oh yeah, and yeah. certainly I was praying for it. Yeah, yeah, but I did, I did send out a prayer uh, back then. It was a, a newsletter. Um, yeah, um, something you'd photocopy and then send it out. We, <laughs> I didn't have a computer. Well, actually, I did have a. I did have my first computer by the time I did my dissertation. But amazing, yeah. amazing. Yeah, and of course there are other volumes. The important two volume miracle book that you wrote that I I constantly refer even in debates with atheists. I tell them look, look at the evidence. Look at the philosophical arguments there. But what we wanna focus the rest of the time on, on, on biography and, and then Mark, as you're working on that now. So you had an interesting experience interacting with a professor. I remember you talking about this, about bio, biographical background of the gospels being biographical. So, so tell us about that. <clears throat> there are actually a few different interesting interactions. Now, I don't want to leave the wrong impression. I had, I had professors who were superb and, and very affirming. But anyway, this professor, uh, he started, he was actually teaching a class on Mark. This was my first semester of my doctoral work. I had a uh, course, uh, Hebrew readings and Dead Sea Scrolls and some other classes, but this one was a class on Mark. And the professor started the class by saying, the gospel of Mark is ancient biography. Ancient biographies were fictitious. Therefore, the Gospel of Mark is fictitious. So I said, wait a minute, my understanding of ancient biography is that ancient biographies were actually basically historical works. I mean, in terms of the way ancient historiography was written, that's kind of the way biography was written in this period. And so I started giving him some examples and, you know, I mentioned, you know, um, especially those who were writing the history of recent events. Well, after I'd finished, he said, hmm, I don't know. I don't know anything about ancient biography. I just read it in the book. So <laughs> this is why never believe anything your professors tell you. I tell my students, don't believe anything we tell you. But no, we can't really do that. They have, <laughs> they have to at least listen to us because otherwise they're gonna have to go and spend all these years reading the primary sources. Um, so, but we do our best to make it available. <laughs> that's Amazing. why I, I, I reference is where I can. So. Right, and that, that's this, I know there are a few anecdotes, but that's the one that, that I was looking for. So, so thanks for that. So one of your more recent books, and again, every time you write a book, you, you feel it's super important. I mean, we, we, we all live like that. That's why we write the books. But Christobiography, what did you attempt to do in that that's different than another book you have about the historical Jesus What's different in this approach? Um, I mentioned some some of these things in in historical Jesus of the Gospels, but as I read the reviews, and even before the reviews started coming out, I stopped and thought, you know, I bet a lot of scholars haven't read ancient biographies, and so they don't know about this. So 
you know, I, I'd said, okay, the gospels are ancient biographies and therefore they should be, you know, we should treat them at least the way we would treat other ancient biographies. I mean, as a, as a Christian, as a believer, I also want to take into account the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and, and, and so on. I mean, these were people associated with Jesus or associated with those who were associated with Jesus right at the beginning of the movement, empowered by the Spirit. But, you know, from a secular, just normal historiographic standpoint, we would use for any document from the first century. Well, what would these be viewed as? Elsewhere in the Greco-Roman world, people would normally view these as, as biographies of some sort. There was, there was a range of kinds of biographies. Well, uh, what were biographies like in the early Roman Empire? And so um, there, were, there were different things that were called lives. There were some of these short things, sometimes like a paragraph or two, that were just anecdotes. But in terms of full length biographies with beginning, middle and end, telling story of a person or story of at least the person's public life, um, when you're dealing with those, uh, the, the, Biography kind of evolved from a few centuries before the Gospels to a few centuries after the Gospels. And a few centuries before, sometimes it was like you'd write the biography of a person either to attack them or to praise them. Um, and a few centuries later, you have a lot of hagiography, uh, just, you know, like, um, again, praising the person and going kind of wild with it. <laughs> um, but in the early Roman Empire, in the time in which the Gospels were written, uh, say from the time of Cornelius Nepos at the end of the Roman Republic uh, to maybe, you know, it varies some, but the early third century with Diogenes Laertius writing lives of, of uh, philosophers. In that period, you have them really depending particularly heavily on actual information from sources. So they're not making things up. I mean, they may, they'll, they'll put their own spin on it, of course. I mean, well, just look at, look at news networks today. <laughs> You've got some spin to the right, some spin to the left, but, um, but you have with uh, ancient biographies, they're supposed to be based on historical information. Now, how accurate would they be? Well, it depends on, um, how accurate their sources were, partly. So if they're writing about things from centuries before, sometimes they admitted, look, we have no way to, to evaluate <laughs> this. this. This may be legendary, but it's the best information we have. But they tried to get the earliest sources available. But when you're dealing with something within living memory, uh, what oral historians speak of is the period when uh, eyewitnesses were, are, are still alive, or those who knew the eyewitnesses are still alive. That tends to be the most accurate period. And so you put those things together, okay? These are ancient biographies from the apex, the, the most accurate period from our historical standpoint of ancient biography. And they're about a character from within living memory, from the time when eyewitnesses were still alive or those who knew them were still alive. It's usually estimated from around 60 to 80 years. Well, that <clears throat> easily covers all the first century gospels. Um, doesn't cover the second century <laughs> later, you know, knockoffs, but it, it covers the, the first century ones. So I, I, went, I went through that and I said, you know, I think the burden of proof should be on those who are saying, you know, that the evangelist just made this stuff up. I mean, that, it's not like most scholars say the evangelist made it all up. Um, but, you know, the core of these stories, just from a, a standard secular historiographic standpoint, the way we would do with Suetonius or Tacitus writing about his father-in-law Agricola or, you know, I mean, <laughs> if we would treat the Gospels with the same respect that we do other sources, uh, now not everybody treats the other sources with, with ideal respect either, but... Um, it, it, I think it's sometimes people say that Christians come to the Gospels with a Christian bias, a canonical bias. But I think that those who don't trust the Gospels are coming with an anti-canonical bias mm. where they wouldn't treat 
say, accounts in other biographies from the period the same way. Some people would, some people are skeptical of everything, but um, I, I, think, I think when we don't have evidence to the contrary, what, what I also did, I gave examples in Christo biography. So uh, one of the things I did, I took three different sources about the Roman emperor Otho and compared them in parallel columns the way we sometimes do with the Synoptic Gospels. And these authors were writing about the Emperor Otho from like somewhere around 50 years after Otho lived. And you can see they're not engaging in just free invention. I mean, they're, they're working with their sources. And sometimes their sources, like Suetonius says, he, oh, by the way, he says toward the end of his book, my, my, uh, my father, my dad was, um, was an officer in Otho's army, you know? So it's not like he, he's unfamiliar with this information. And, and, and I had some of my doctoral students, I, I went one time for one of our PhD seminars on historical Jesus. They said, look, you can write a regular paper if you want to, it's fine. But if you want to, we can, we can uh, here's something that hasn't been done before. You know, what I did with, with Otho, we can do that with some other ancient, ancient biographers and historians and see, see how this worked. And so some of them decided to do their dissertations on that. And they, they produced papers for the class that were like uh, the advance copy of the argument. And, and uh, we put together a book based on that. So that way everybody gets credit for their work. We can cite their work. We can all build on each other's work, but you know, citing it appropriately. And, and, yeah. and, and just to just to jump in, then um, let's say we take Luke's gospel. We're, mm -hmm. we're going to go to Mark in a moment, but let's say we take Luke's gospel. Uh, the whole idea that they were just creating stories and mythological things, and and we can't take it seriously. Uh, Luke couldn't have gone out of his way anymore to tell us that his intent was quite the opposite. So, just I mean, off the top of your head, obviously you've done this many a time. But just to op open up the beginning of Luke to us as to why he's telling us, I'm, I'm giving you a historical account of biography as accurately as I can. Yeah. Novels didn't have historical prefaces like Luke did. Also, they ordinarily didn't depend on just massive amounts of sources like, well, they didn't depend on massive amounts of sources. Also, you never have novels written about recent historical characters. Mm. Once in a while, they were about historical characters, but, but never about recent historical characters. The vast majority of them, ancient novels, were romances, a feature that's kind of lacking in the Gospels and Acts. Um, and Luke tells us in his historical preface what he's going to write about. He says about the events fulfilled among us. Well, that's what you get in a historical preface, not, not you know, I mean, you have this one thing that some people have called a historical preface in this one novel, but it's telling you how the how the author made this story up. <laughs> it's not, I mean, that's a novel preface, but Luke gives you a historical preface that the events fulfilled among us. And clearly he's not trying to just make up a bunch of stories and pull the wool over his audience's eyes because he dedicates the book to Theophilus, most excellent Theophilus. Um, and he says, uh, to confirm the things that you've already heard. So these stories were widely circulated already in the, in the early church. And Luke also tells us that in terms of, in, in verse one of Luke's gospel, he, he says, now many have written about these things already. So most of us think he used Mark as a source. Many of us, including myself, also think that he had a common source shared with what's now the gospel of Matthew. Um, Maybe, maybe the common source was an early form of Matthew, whatever it was, that's, that's all debatable. But um, he, he, he's got uh, not just those, but he's got many written sources he could appeal to. Uh, he, he, he's aware of them. And, and then he speaks of the oral material going back to eyewitnesses. And he certainly had time to interview some people who were eyewitnesses. Uh, if you look at the, well, uh, when, he, when he speaks of um, many translations in verse three say he thoroughly investigated. And actually David Messner at TCU has, has shown by parallels with other ancient historical prefaces, 
But that language probably doesn't just mean thoroughly investigated. It means to have thorough acquaintance with, mm. often by somebody who was involved in the movement or involved in the events, which, uh, and, and David doesn't, doesn't, I don't think he says this directly, but it's certainly consistent with what you have in Acts 16, 10 and following, where the author says, we. Now, this one's debated. Uh, usually when an issue is debated, I'll say, okay, here's the majority view. Here's the minority view. I hold the minority view or a minority view, or I hold the, ma the majority view or, or whatever. This one's debated, but even many of those who think that it's not the author saying we admit that the majority view is that the author, at least of the, the we material, actually is claiming to be there. And for me, this one seems to be a no-brainer because in other ancient historiographic works, when the person says we, they actually mean we. <laughs> I mean, same thing we mean by we normally. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or I. Uh, when they say I, they mean I. And and he's not. It's not like he's emphasizing his role there. He's just, you know, it's just simpler for him to say we than for him to say. And also, I, Luke, myself was there. Uh, so he's just there part of the time. The the we leaves off when Paul gets to Philippi. Years later, when Paul gets back to Philippi, the we picks up again and follows through the end of the book of Acts. The we material is the most detailed material in Acts. It makes sense that Luke was there. And that includes, you, you can gather this from uh, Acts 24, 27, and 27, 1 and 2. That includes up to two years in Judea. Probably most of it spent in Caesarea. But, I mean, the people that Luke met <laughs> included James, the brother of Jesus, so uh, uh, Jacob, <laughs> Yaakov, uh, the brother of Jesus. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, how would he know about the infancy of Jesus? Well, maybe maybe Jesus' mom told some of the kids. Uh, and then he also met Philip the evangelist. He met um, Manasin, an old disciple. Uh, he probably, well, he stayed with Philip at least temporarily. My guess is he probably stayed with him longer than that. That's why he has all these stories about Philip early in the gospel. He's early in the book of Acts. I mean, Luke actually had a chance to check these things out. He doesn't claim to be an eyewitness himself. And if he's making this up, why not claim to be an eyewitness of the resurrection, uh, the, the empty tomb, or, you know, the day of Pentecost, you know, but he, he comes in just traveling around with Paul mm. and it plays down his own. Uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, I think it's a no brainer. Again, I know people disagree. The main, the main reason that people dissent from this, they say, well, Luke thinks differently than Paul does. And, and my response to that is, yeah, but nobody's saying Paul wrote the book of Acts. I mean, <laughs> of course, Luke exactly. thinks differently. Luke, Luke is writing at a different time in a different, different situation, and he's not Paul. That doesn't mean he didn't know Paul. Um, but anyway. Yeah, so, so what's fascinating is if Lucan theology in every way was exactly what Paul would have said the way he would have said it, they would have said, obviously it's artificial. Yeah. The fact that there seem to be apparent differences, obviously if you dig deeper, I don't think there are differences at all, but just reporting from different angles, that, that would make sense. Hey, just a quick word, everyone watching, if you tuned in partway through, this is the first of a new series, Dr. Brown talks with scholars and I'm honored and blessed to have a, a, a dear friend Craig Keener, our, our big regret is we don't get to spend much time with each other, but we, we enjoy it when we can. We grab it when we can. And every so often we get to minister side by side, do some, which is just is a dream. Um, but if you're just watching, we plan to be releasing these all one every month or so, every few weeks. But if you're watching on YouTube and you're not a subscriber to my channel, click subscribe and there's a bell. Click the bell this way when a new video comes out. We do five radio broadcasts a week and other special videos dealing with cultural issues in the world around us, Bible answers and things. So make sure you subscribe and click on the bell. Okay, I've got a couple of Mark-related questions. Go ahead, one go more, ahead. One more thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the people who say that Luke is not Paul, they say, look, look at how Luke portrays Paul. 
I mean, he shaves his head for a vow in Acts 18, 18. I, 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 there, I don't have much to shave. Uh, <sighs> where is my hairbrush? Sorry, that's from Veggie Tales. So, yeah. um, but, but 18, 18, he shaves his head for a vow. Acts 21, he supports some Nazarites um, and, 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 and so forth. And they say, this, this is totally wrong. Luke gets Paul totally wrong. He makes Paul out to be Jewish. Can you imagine that? Imagine it. Imagine most, it. Most Pauline scholars today agree that Paul was Jewish and did, did do things like this. And so, you know, the problem was with these, uh, some of yeah. the scholars that came up with these things. I mean, at the very least, if someone said it was audiophoric and it was Paul as a Jew to the Jews, that would make sense. But it's obviously deeper than that. He, he was a Jew. Why, yeah. why wouldn't a Jew following the Jewish Messiah live as a Jew? But then Paul understood the, the relate his relationship to the law and so on, and and obviously these dynamic life changing ways. Okay, I did post on social media we were going to be doing an interview, and I I said told folks I was going to grab a question or two from them. So right at the end, we're going to get a, a, a the shortest answer to a couple of questions. All right, uh, because I know anything I ask you, the question is, do I want the five minute answer, the five hour answer, the five week answer? So. We'll do a couple of short ones at the end, but I want to dive into Mark because you're you're working on it now. Um, the language of Mark, is there anything in the Greek of like either ah or oh or movement or the way that he writes? What's Mark's Greek like? <clears throat> his his Greek isn't of this, I mean, Luke's Greek is of a much higher register. So if you've just had a year of Greek. Luke is going to be harder for you than Mark. Mark is, Mark is pretty easy Greek. Um, but Mark also uses what's called a parat paratactic Greek or parataxis, uh, very similar to what you often have in Hebrew and, and maybe modeled after thinking that way, although um, this, this was pretty common in the kind of um, ordinary Greek of the period called Koine. So, he can begin each sentence with and, 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 and like I just did. He doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't do too many, I mean, he has participles, but he's not as heavily participle to say as, as Luke would be. He has, uh, uses a lot of historical presence. So you, you get kind of an action focus and he goes and he says, and he uses the word euthus immediately all over the place so you get this sense of action and movement and, and say like at, at, at the at his baptism what happens to the heavens oh the heavens are ripped open <laughs> you know, he uses uh, that that word schizo again at the uh, at the at the ripping of the temple curtain in in uh, in mark 15 uh, where it's ripped from from top to, to bottom. amazing amazing uh, so so you have the spirit of God coming down from heaven in Mark 1.10 uh, on Jesus like a dove, uh, <clears throat> maybe evoking possibly among other things, the uh, dove uh, symbolizing a new creation like the restoration with Noah, but also um, the, the rending of the temple curtain. Now God is coming down in, a, in another way um, and scholars debate whether this is the the Shekinah departing from the temple at that point in judgment or God opening wide the Holy of Holies to everybody or both. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I, there's so much to talk about there. But anyway, and and in, the, in the wilderness, he's with the wild animals, just yeah. all these little, even though Mark's shorter, yeah. what are some of the unique things that you find in Mark that you don't find elsewhere? Mark is really, Mark is just super with irony um just just the whole thing is shaped like irony you know you read the you read the chapter of the main chapter of parables in chapter four and a lot of the parables function as riddles and and those with deeper insight deep enough insight to press into jesus inner circle and hear the interpretations they're the ones who who get it and the outsiders go away scratching their heads like this is a, a riddle. The whole gospel of Mark kind of functions that way in some ways. You have to read it over and over again 
sometimes to catch the riddle. Um, you've got the um, Mark emphasizing Jesus' secret identity. You know, he's, he's keeping things kind of secret, except where he can't, like when he, he, he's put on the spot in public or something um, <laughs> by, a, by a demoniac in the a synagogue in Capernaum in chapter one or in the chapter two, you know, the people let the paralytic down through the roof. I mean, you're, you're on the spot then. I mean, he's, he can't just take the guy aside somewhere and yep. uh, you can't, can't get out the door anyway. It's blocked with all the people. So, um, but initially he's, he's keeping it a secret. You still have that in the other gospels, but it's really a heavy emphasis in Mark because, you know, we know from verse one, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, we, if if we didn't have verse one, we'd still know it from uh, chapter one and verse eleven, where where the Father says, "This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased." Uh, and again in chapter nine and verse seven, where you have the heavenly voice that says the same thing. But <clears throat> the the people in the story, they don't get it, and so that creates some suspense. Mm. Um, oh, there's so much. There's so much there. And, and, you know, just the vividness, like I think in Mark 3, where you've got side by side, his family thinks he's crazy and the religious leaders think he's demon, demonized. And they're side by, these accounts side by side. The, and then right after that, you've got in verses 31 to 35, his family shows up and they're outside the door, just like Jesus spoke of those who were outside, not understanding the parables, um, mm. but also the... Um, Oh, and another thing in chapter three, side by side, this one, this one is clearer in Greek than it is in English, where you have the, the, uh, the, de the demoniacs falling down before him, and you have, you have the people falling on him, pressing mm. on him, but literally it's falling on him. So you have this, this, uh, this contrast, but you get this chapter 16 and verse eight, and, and, and the, uh, you know, finally, all the, all the way through the gospel, don't tell anybody, but finally, uh, well, except for the the guy in the Gentile territory in chapter five, verse nineteen and twenty, but in in sixteen seven, the angel says, "Go tell his disciples that Jesus is no longer dead." And in verse eight, it says, "And they went their way and they told nobody because they were scared." I'm like, <laughs> what a way to end the gospel! <laughs> but it, it it invites you, like, oh, what would happen if? Because of course they eventually told, but. What would have happened if they hadn't told? And 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 can we probably the Mark's church? I mean, he's writing to people who may have to lay down their lives for Christ, and maybe some of them have failed to do that, and they're like Peter who denied him under persecution. But uh, but no, we need to go tell the good news: Jesus is alive. Mm. Just, Oh, there's so much we could talk All right, about. so, so I, I want to come back to the end of Mark in a second, but a Bible background question. So Mark 4, the parables. So there's the quotation from Isaiah 6. Mm -hmm. And of course, I focus on that in my doctoral dissertation because of the use of the word heal there. Mm -hmm. Lest the people turn and, and be healed. But Mark's reading there seems to reflect what, would, what we'd have in, in, in a Targumic reading or, or a other, perhaps another ancient Jewish reading. Do you think that's, Mark's interpretation of Isaiah 6, or do you think Mark is, is just thinking in terms of other Jewish interpretations of the passage, whether, whether, whereas instead of, of healing, it's forgiveness, and, in, and even a, you know, the people involved change slightly? What, what's your take on that? I think it's a, it's a fair interpretation of the passage. I mean, when you go from one language to another, you don't get everything. And so mm -hmm. I think in Isaiah, healing includes healing the people's sins. It also includes, you know, the, the nuance of physical healing, although the fullness of that comes, you know. Right, in, in, certainly not to that, focus on Isaiah. Isaiah 6 is certainly not a focus on physical healing, for yeah. sure. But, right. But like with Isaiah 35, 5 and 6, there you've got, right. you know, in, in uh, Matthew 11 and Luke 7, Jesus fulfilling that. Um, but I, th I think there's a bit of irony in Isaiah 6, and also in Mark four, it's not like God doesn't want people to turn. Right. And, and by the way, in my Isaiah commentary that I'm in the early stages, I'm just got through chapter six. And I said, there has to be some irony in, in this is it is a commission that just as he speaks the truth, hearts will be hardened. 
Yeah. And and that's often a result of the preaching of the gospel. So the same, uh, the old saying, the same sun that that bakes the clay melts the wax, yep. right? Yep. But there's definitely some divine irony in it. So so Mark is picking up on that. I I, I think I think Mark is doing doing essentially the same thing, because later in the chapter, he says there's nothing hidden except in order that it should be revealed. Mm. So the secret has to be kept initially, uh, the the mystery of the kingdom. And of course, the mystery of the kingdom is who the king is, Jesus. Um, he goes around saying he's king, or too many other people say he's king. You're going to have Roman intervention. You're going to have the crucifixion early. <laughs> so um, to have time to teach his disciples, to have time to get more of the message out, he's being subtle. And he's really coy. I mean, with the religious leaders, he'll, he'll say things that may provoke them, but he won't give them enough <laughs> to to nail him. But then finally in Mark 14, though, you have the most direct answer of I, I am. That's right. Not just you say, but yeah, I yeah. am. So what do you think Mark's more direct there? The secret, the secret is out. It's no Secret's longer out. Got it. Yeah, I mean, he, he's already getting pretty close to it in Mark chapter 12, uh, verse, verse six, where he talks about the owner of the vineyard. I mean, that's transparent, you know, from Isaiah chapter five, what the vineyard is all about. This is God's people. Here you have the tenants of the vineyard who are exploiting the vineyard. They're not handling the vineyard rightly. You know, God loves the vineyard, but the tenants, the, you know, the people who are supposed to be running it for him, who refuse to give him his fruit. Well, finally he says in 12, six, he's gonna send his beloved son. Well, hint, hint. <laughs> and, and then later on in chapter 12, uh, so, who is who is the Messiah? Is he is he just David's son? Mm. No, uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. <clears throat> and the Lord said to my Lord, I mean, you would often have a king enthroning their son beside them or or empowering their son, or or a god in the Assyrian texts, for example, might say that to the king who was being installed. So this one isn't just David's son, he's God's son. I mean, he's, he's, he's starting to let the information yes. out. And Bartimaeus, son of David, nobody, you know, the people want to shut him up, but Jesus doesn't. It's, it's, it's about time. Got it. So for, now it can be more over. It. All right. I, I, I had one more question, but I have two. Sorry. And, and then, all right, on Mark, because you just got me thinking too much. All right, <laughs> Mark, Mark 7, 19, we know compared to, to Matthew 15, uh, where Jesus, where, where Matthew ends the account about the, eating with unwashed hands, saying that that's what he's talking about, eating. So if you eat food with unwashed hands, it doesn't, doesn't defile. But then Mark 7, 19, the gloss there, uh, thus purging all meats or making all foods clean, and then debate about, you know, what Greek text is right. Is it just no the food passes out and is purged out or is, okay, so, so your take uh, on, on the, the Mark and gloss there to what Jesus said, is Mark telling us that Jesus declared all foods clean, meaning go ahead and eat pig, or is he just giving us a spiritual insight that food doesn't defile you without telling you to go eat pig? Or is he simply saying, if you eat food with unwashed hands and it's unclean, it doesn't defile you? Or, or is there another way that you read it? <clears throat> all of those are possible readings. And so I haven't completely, my, the way I've taken it has been that he's, declaring all foods are kosher. Um, so similar to probably Romans 14 or Colossians 2, but- Well, so, so the, the pushback against that is he's just rebuked the religious leaders for making right. the word void with their tradition. Now can he as Messiah, who is a law keeper and a law upholder, now come with his word and change, the, change what the Torah says? Would that be acceptable as the Messiah? So that's the, the pushback to it. It is God in the flesh, but yeah, I mean, that is, um, and, I, and I have, like I said, this, is, this has been my view uh, and also Acts 10, but right. there, are, there are also ways of addressing all those, but, uh, but I think that um, a case really can be made for you know, just having to do with the unwashed hands. Uh, so I, I, I haven't I haven't settled on that yet. Right now, in the commentary, I'm I'm in five twenty one to forty three. 
so I haven't gotten Got to that part yet. But but Jesus does challenge the impurity um, ideas of his day. Now that one is a biblical one. Yeah, uh, biblical. I mean, to me, the 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 way I've understood it, and again, with the, I've only written commentaries so far in Jeremiah and Job. Although Jeremiah is the longest book of the Bible in words, and Job may be the most difficult. Now Isaiah. So at least <laughs> at least I've you know I've done it. It took is. slightly challenging books, but the fun thing is when you do it, like going through Isaiah, I wonder what I'm going to decide. You know, certain things you've, you've wrestled with for years because you're going to have to decide something, right? Yeah. But I've understood it that he was making that spiritual point that in point of fact, all food itself is clean. But without telling anyone to go live differently, we know Peter still wasn't by Acts 10. So mm -hmm. it was a spiritual insight. And what you eat can't defile you. In that sense, all food is clean itself. But in any case, so do you think that Mark actually ended at 16.8 or do we do not have the end? Yeah, yeah, I think Mark ended at 16.8. Um, Extraordinary. Some people, Extraordinary. Some people think that the, you know, that Mark's ending was lost because sometimes the ending of a manuscript could, could get lost. But um, I don't think that's a good explanation. In Mark's case, there would have been more than one copy made initially. For, for work like that. Um, and then also, um, also the big thing is it makes sense of the shape of Mark, the, the riddling, uh, the, the- Fascinating. Parabolic. Yeah, it, 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 uh, it, just the irony of it all the way through, go and tell, or no, sorry, don't, don't go and tell. And, they, and what do they do? They tell. And finally he says, tell, and they don't tell anybody. I mean, it's just, Pure Mark and I so I've got to tell. We've got to tell. We've got to. We've got to shout it out. Yeah. Okay. So super Ver quick. Verses yeah, nine through twenty though are definitely not the original. I mean, right, the style right. is completely different. And and I, I mean, I think it's good. I love verses nine through twenty, but I don't think it was the original ending of Mark. Right. So to come to that, so obviously the the shift in subjects from from eight to nine doesn't work, and then the vocabulary is, is different, right? Mm -hmm. Vocabulary and style from nine through twenty. Okay, so uh, my there's something of it that has always struck me as authentic in terms of the content that, mm -hmm. that I can't say it's scripture, but that it, to me it would preserve mm -hmm. early words of Jesus and teachings of, of Jesus. Um, and obviously we are both continuationists. We believe that that mm -hmm. wouldn't violate our theology to say right. that these things continue to this day. So is, is, that, is that your basic assessment? It's, it's not original ending of Mark, for sure, you can't necessarily, you, you can't put it as scripture on the same level, but it, it's authentic preservation of, of Jesus' words or tradition? Yeah. Um, and by the way, if anybody's worried about this, they think I'm saying something strange. If you, if you have any translation other than the, probably the old King James, I don't know if the new King James does this, I don't remember, but Normally, there'll be at least a footnote that'll tell you this is right. missing in many of the earliest manuscripts. Um, so the vast majority of um, text critics, including evangelical, you know, all across the board, don't, don't think it was original. Uh, but most of what it says you have in the other Gospels or in the Book of Acts. Right. So, I mean, and, then, <laughs> and you have an attestation as early as the Peshitta. And then yeah. different church fathers quoting it and stuff. So again, we don't want to make a major debate over that because for me, it, it still comes out the same way. If I'm going to quote it, I just say I'm quoting from the longer ending of Mark, <laughs> you know, so this people now understand that I understand, yeah. but yeah, then can we verify this elsewhere, et, et cetera? Yeah. It's, it's uh, elsewhere. The, 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 what it says is elsewhere. And, you know, if, I mean, I won't quote, say, the Didache or First Clement is scripture, but there are a lot of great insights in it. They're, they're uh, first century or the latest early second century documents. And those are, uh, and even some, I mean, I can quote Augustine or Martin Luther or Michael Brown. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, but scripture is in the place by itself. Got it. All right. So I'm going to grab a, a, a Twitter question here and a a, um, a Facebook question. And, and by the way, uh, of, of course, Craig, I'm jealous over your time because I get asked to do interviews constantly and obviously can't do all of them. I know you try to do many, but but I know that you could be spending this time 
in prayer or study or writing or, or with your wonderful wife and family, et cetera. So I want to be jealous of this, but, but we do have a little history. Uh, tell folks what happened when you visited the Brownsville Revival and you taught for our students and then they, you got together with them to answer questions. <laughs> I was going to, the first thing I was going to, uh, I, I was thinking you were going to say was when we got together and I was like, well, I hold that interpretation too. We agreed on so much. And then, and then uh, we were looking something up in the Talmud and I had the English version and you had the, the uh, Aramaic and, and you found it first. Uh, I was really impressed with your Semitic languages skills, but anyway. Uh, but the easy thing there, I knew what I was looking, you know, when you know what you're looking for, you can scan a page really fast. It's like not here, not here. So it was Aramaic, but yeah, I, I, I appreciate that memory. <laughs> but uh, anyway, yes, yeah, so you're with our students. Yeah. What, what, what happened? Well, I, I was not gonna be, um, I, had, I had to leave uh, the, the, next, the next day. <laughs> so I said, well, let's get together for Bible study. Any of you want to, and they were so hungry. And they kept asking questions. And so I think we started at three in the afternoon and we finished at five in the morning. Yeah, and, and you had students younger that had curfews. So you ended up hanging out with the older, I mean, some just violated the curfew, which was oh. fine. We thought that was acceptable. But yeah, I think you had to switch locations and then with other couples, et cetera. Yeah, so I, I know what could happen if I start ans asking more questions. So I'm gonna take one from Twitter and I apologize to folks, I, I said I take one, and I'm going to take one from Facebook. So, um, this is one someone with the the Twitter handle Lamasu, uh, and I'm going to add to it. I like to ask what he considers the basis for John's logos. Is it the Targumim, so the Memra tradition, or the wisdom tradition present in apocryphal texts, texts like Wisdom of Solomon, or what they didn't ask there follows logos? What's what's your take? I think there's a blending of some of the things. I don't think it's the Memra. I actually did a chapter of my dissertation on, on uh, the background of, uh, of the Logos. Um, so John wants to communicate about God who is distinct from the Father, God the Son. What word would best communicate that to his audience? And uh, because of the wisdom tradition, and actually, you know, going back, Egyptians the way they used it too. But um, the the biblical wisdom tradition, and as it was developed, you have it in Sirach and um, Wisdom of Solomon. Uh, but but going back to Proverbs uh, chapter eight and so on, wisdom being personified, and that comes over in the Hellenistic Jewish writer, kind of a Jewish philosopher, Philo of Alexandria where he speaks in terms of the logos, um, God's word. And, and sometimes is, it seems like it's more than a personification for some of the writers, especially for Philo, um, as a mediator between God and the world, God and the powers that he created and so on. <clears throat> but I also think there's something else going on. I think Philo may have not wanted to call this mediator Sophia wisdom because that would be a chukma because that would be um, feminine. <laughs> and Philo was a male chauvinist pig by anybody's standards. But I think with John, there's something different going on because logos can mean word. Um, and Philo also has the stoic idea of the logos in his background. Uh, as a middle platonist, he could integrate different things. But in terms of, um, in terms of, John, <clears throat> uh, Jewish people often identified wisdom and the word and the Torah. Uh, you find it, for example, in, in Baruch 3 and 4, and uh, I think in Sirach and, and elsewhere. The rabbis were really big on that. Uh, but this is, this is pre-rabbinic. And you know, all things were created by God's word, John 1, 3. Well, uh, later rabbis, I think this is already in, in Mishnah Abot, uh, rabbis talked about how God created the world through his 10 commandments. <laughs> 10 times he said, Vo'amer, <laughs> and he said. And then also in uh, 
you, you get to verses 14 through 18, that's the climax of the prologue. And there you have an allusion back to Exodus 33 and 34. Because, uh, of course, um, loving kindness and truth, uh, chesed ve'emet, is all over the place in the Old Testament. But, um, but in Exodus 33 and 34, you have kind of a climax of this because um, there God was giving his word, his law, his Torah on Mount Sinai. And Moses ended up smashing the tablets because of the golden calf in chapter 32, went back up on the mountain. Once God to dwell with his people, God is not real excited about that idea, but really loves Moses. Moses is his friend. And so Moses says, show me your glory. And God says, Moses, you can't see all my glory. Nobody can see all my glory and live, but I'll show you part of my glory. And as the Lord passes before Moses, he sees this cosmic spectacle of fireworks. But even more than that, he sees what well, God reveals his character and nature to Moses. So the Lord passes before him, the Lord the Lord, Rav Chesed um, the Lord, full of uh, abounding in covenant love and covenant faithfulness, or abounding in faithful love and faithfulness. It could be translated in Greek as full of grace and truth. And so John says, We beheld his glory, just like Moses did. We beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. And and then in verse 17, he says, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. Wait a minute. Grace and truth were already there in Mount Sinai. Mm. But Moses could only see part of it. Mm. No one can see all of God's glory and live. But John says, we behold his glory. And in, in, verse, in verse 18, he says, no one has beheld God at any time. But then he says, the, the one and only God who is in the bosom of the Father has made him known. So that Jesus could stand before his disciples and say, the one who's seen me has seen the Father. The very, the very image of God, just like uh, in Wisdom of Solomon 7, 27 or so, 26, 27, um, and, and elsewhere in Jewish literature, God's wisdom is his image. Um, well, Jesus is the image of God. Jesus is, is the word. He's the full embodiment. Moses got to see only part of that when the law was given, but this time that God's word came, mm. the word became flesh. And people were expecting this cosmic spectacle of fireworks. We're gonna get that at the second coming. But this time we got to see the fullness of God's glory in a way that we could understand most concretely. Because throughout the, the gospel of John, it speaks of him being glorified. Um, He's glorified through his signs, John 2, 11, and so on. But you get to chapter 12. Uh, Jesus says, a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies. It brings forth much fruit. And he says, that's how the Son of Man will be glorified. As Jesus is lifted up on the cross, at the very point where we as humans were pounding the nails in his hands, he was declaring, see how much I love you. We saw the fullness of God's heart bared before us, the fullness of grace and truth, the fullness of God's faithful love and faithfulness. So the word, the word that we have in scripture, Psalm 119, that the law is God's word, we get the full revelation when we look at the cross and we see God's heart for us. And friends, for all those that just think, this is about an academic exercise. It's, it's not, you know, Craig's heartbeat is ultimately that people know Jesus better, know God for themselves. And, and you know, Craig, you've you shared the gospel endlessly with the lost. You know, that's, that's your burden. God, God had to call you to do the work of scholarship because otherwise you just would have gone to done missions and reached out. And of course, we're enriched by it. So thank you. That, that's wonderful. Um, last question. And out of the many that were posted on Facebook, again, apologies, I said I'd, I'd pull one. So we'll, again, you give a real long answer on this, but just the, the shortest synopsis kind of answer. The Book of Enoch, what should we think of it and why isn't it part of the Bible? It is part of the Ethiopic canon. The, right, the, only Ethiopic, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
But um, I think that's partly because Jude quotes from it, but that Paul quotes from Greek poets, and and I think there are allusions to the, you know, Sirach and Wisdom of Solomon and and so on in the New Testament too. Um, I think you got a wis Wisdom of Solomon in John chapter three and so on. But um, there, there's useful information, and in it. it's certainly it's very useful as background for understanding the way. Um, uh, just just one, when we say so, the book, the book of Enoch, is that oversimplified? Yeah, it is. It is kind of oversimplified. Uh, there's five five sections of it. Well, a uh, first Enoch. But you've also got second Enoch and third Enoch. Third Enoch is but Rabbi Ishmael. It's kind of a rabbinic uh, take on Jewish mysticism. But uh, first Enoch is um, <clears throat> it's much of it is preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Everything except the similitudes of Enoch. That's uh, one of the books of Enoch, uh, which is chapters 37 to 71. There's debate on how early that is. But the rest of First Enoch is clearly early. It's preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls, probably most of it from the second century BC. And, uh, but I mean, you wouldn't want it to be in the canon, especially now what we know about astronomy. I mean, <laughs> uh, what you have like in, chapters 72 through 91 or whatever, uh, some of the astronomical stuff there and some of the uh, natural philosophy there just is not very uh, tenable in light of what we know about nature today. And yet um, there's also some debate as to whether this is based on somebody's genuine visions or this is just somebody made it up and this was the style that they were using because they thought of it as just a, an appropriate literary style. But it definitely wasn't written by Enoch. Uh, you know, Enoch in, in Genesis 5 was way before the second century BC. The second century BC is, is after the Old Testament, um, at least for those of us who date all the Old Testament before. Right, that. right, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, for, for those who date it later, uh, it's at least after almost all the Old Testament. But otherwise, right, it's written after the Old Testament, before the New Testament, yeah. and, and of interest and of value, but never never part of the Bible. What, was there any, any ancient Jewish or Christian canonical list of authority that where it occurs that you're aware of? I don't think so. I think in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's possible. We don't have a list from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right. But it's possible that they used Jubilees and Enoch in a semi-canonical way. Um, but the rabbis don't seem to have considered those things. And when you get Josephus's um, number of books, and also in the New Testament, I mean, you have a, a number of things quoted and a greater number of things alluded to. Certainly the Maccabean stuff is alluded to a lot. But you when you have a scripture formula, like as it is written. Yep. Now, now with Enoch, first Enoch, he doesn't say in Jude, as it is written, Jude, Jude 9, I think, as it is written, uh, you know, it's, I think first Enoch 1, 9, he's quoting. Anyway, he, he doesn't say, as it is written. He does speak of it, I think, as prophecy, but you can have obviously prophecy that's not in the canon. We have Old Testament prophets whose prophecies aren't recorded, like in First right. Corinthians 15 and First First Corinthians 14. I mean, people prophesying in local churches that never made it into scripture. So yeah, exactly. So a lot of interesting stuff in it. There's kind of a renewed fascination. And I, I even got blasted, you know, hate mail for daring to say no, Enoch should not be part of the Bible. So this is like <laughs> passionate acceptance of it, but no, it, it never was. It, was, it was highly read and esteemed by early Jews and Christians, but beyond that, no. And your, your, your Mark commentary is for the International Critical Commentary Series, and you'd be one of the, the first modern evangelicals to contribute to that. I mean, it's not, uh, and people are critical, it doesn't mean you're criticizing the Bible, it's just written a certain way, and it's, it's some of the most brilliant biblical scholarship in terms of Going in death, uh, 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 Williamson's commentaries on Isaiah. Uh, he's he's through the first twelve chapters now, and maybe he's twelve hundred pages in. But I mean, that's it's dense, it's rich, it's wonderful. Uh, do you have a projected length of what you think your more commentary is going to be? It's going to be it's going to be one volume. 
No. No. <laughs> I'm actually worried. Uh, that's that's why I'm, I'm not like telling everybody it's ICC because I hope they keep me. It may get too long, but they, they told me I could go long, but. No, they value that. They value that. Look, I mean, what, what about uh, Allison and, and Davies, exactly, yeah. Matthew, three, three, volumes, yeah. three volumes, right? Yeah. It, in, yeah. in Massive Death. And William, again, Williamson is just, he's two volumes in and just through 12 chapters and it's dense, right? I just hope they'll forgive me if, if Mark, which is only half as many chapters, goes longer than Matthew, which is... It'll uh, be a, mo a modern classic, uh, <laughs> another we're indebted to. Hey, but, go ahead. No, yeah, um, the, the one that it's replacing actually is over a century old. It's by Ezra Gould. And he actually was pretty conservative on most, most things. He didn't believe in demons, but <laughs> he did. Well, some of the, the Romans commentaries, right? The old, yeah. the old and the new both Grant, were. Cranfield, I think, wrote that, right? Yeah. Uh, and then Sandy and Hedlund before that. Yeah. Yeah. And then Cranfield, right? So those, those were yeah. certainly more conservative. Um, but maybe Romans allowed for that a, a bit more. Uh, well, I, I, the, big, yeah, the big thing is one needs to be fair. So yeah. cite the range of sources, be fair to, to all the views and, you know, and then you can state your own too, but. <laughs> exactly. And, and I think Mark could potentially lend itself to that as well. In, in other words, you don't have as many crazy theories or, or, you know, or, or like dating of the Pentateuch type of thing with, with Mark so that, that allows it. But again, you're going to be fair that your, your scholarship, but we're, uh, listen, I'm a debt to you as a brother and friend, just enjoying our, our fellowship and time together. What you don't know, friend, is that Craig is quite a jokester. Well, you may know that if you follow, if you're a friend of us on Facebook, you, you'd know that, but um, just enriched by your scholarship. And I just wanted to say this over you from, from the end of Psalm 90, So may the, the beauty, the favor of the Lord be on you. May he establish the work of your hands. And, and again, it's repeated, the, the work of, of your hands our hands, but yours, may he establish it. So uh, may the Lord's blessing be on your labors, on your family. Uh, may you get glimpses of the fruit that, that, uh, that you've borne and the reward that awaits you in, in heaven. And I can't wait to, to look forward to the, to the new works coming out in the days ahead. Uh, thanks so much, Craig. Really appreciate it. Thank you, brother. It's always wonderful to be with you.